Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we're investigating where Hawaii's fish come from with Dr. Brian Bowen's research team at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology on Coconut Island. They have collected samples of reef fishes from Okinawa, Japan in the Western Pacific to compare with reef fishes in Hawaii. And now they also have samples from reef fishes south of Hawaii. Brian's team has just returned from a trip to Karasmas, a remote coral atoll 1,000 miles south of Oahu that is also known as Christmas Island. While at Karasmas, Bowen's team gathered genetic samples from local fish to compare with Hawaii fish. The relationships in DNA that they discover will tell us about the resiliency of our own local fish populations and reveal secrets of the historical migration of reef fish across Oceania. We start off talking with researcher Michael Hoban. So you just got back from Christmas Island. Yes, that's like nowhere I've ever been. Tell me a little bit about the island. So it's a, it's an atoll, just like a, basically it used to be a high island, but it's subsided and so now it's flat. I don't think any part of the island is more than four or five feet above sea level. Turns out it's the largest atoll in the world, by landmass at any rate. There's a large lagoon in the middle and then the outside there's fringing reefs all the way around that kind of slope down into the abyss. So there's some interesting things to see when you're out there diving and yeah, it was just great. How was um, the underwater habitat there? It was really beautiful, but also kind of sad. Um, so the reefs are almost entirely dead right now there. Uh, but they died so recently that they still have all of their complex structure. Uh, so it's this, you know, amazing big complex coral reefs, but it's sadly all dead coral. The, the flip side of that is that there's still a ton of fish. It kind of shows you that the things that we think of as coral reef fish don't necessarily need coral, they just need reef. Um, and so, but there are signs that it's recovering. And so if we, if they get a few years without another nasty El Nino, which is what hit them in the first place, I think that they'll, their reefs will come back. Cause there's a lot of the signs that you see of, you know, you see baby corals growing and there's a kind of algae that grows over things that is good for corals. And there's a lot of that kind of algae. There's a lot of big upright algae, which is not necessarily good, but there's tons and tons of herbivorous fishes, which tend to eat that stuff. So it's not like it's sad to look at, but I don't think it's a hopeless cause. One of the glorious things about being a scientist is that there comes a, a shining moment when you know something that nobody else on the planet knows. And it's important, it's something that matters like how we can protect the fishes here in Hawaii. And then you get to go tell the world. And I don't know any feeling that's better than that. What we're trying to do is make sure there's plenty of fish out there for everyone. Uh, make sure that the natural resources are there for our grandchildren. If the fish on one island get whacked, either through a natural disaster or through overfishing, we want to know, are they going to get replenished by fish coming in from elsewhere? Or do they have to recover on their own? Because if they have to recover on their own, it's going to take a lot longer. And it means those ecosystems are more fragile. The project we're working on is the origins of Hawaiian reef fishes. Now, as you know, the history of Hawaii starts with bare volcanic rocks that come rising up out of the ocean, okay? Millions of years ago. And then a thousand years ago, when the Polynesians found this place, they didn't find a bare rock. <laughs> they found a lush tropical paradise. And everything there, all that wildlife, had to come from somewhere else. Even the fish. Even the fish. We're a long way from other reefs. When they start life, the fish interbreed and they produce eggs, fertilized eggs. And after a couple of days, those eggs hatch. And the larvae, the little baby fishes, float around out there for a month or two months sometimes. And it's that floating larval stage that makes connections into Hawaii. So we're really talking about currents that are bringing those tiny, maybe even microscopic larval fish across the ocean. Right, these little tiny fish can swim. If they hear a reef, 
it might be 10 miles away, they're capable of swimming for it. For 10 miles? Oh, 10 or more. Some of the demonstrations indicate they can swim up to 30 or 40 miles. We think there's basically two pathways into Hawaii. One is to hopscotch up the Line Islands, which are south of here and they straddle the equator. And that fish might hop from the Line Islands. The northernmost one is Palmyra. Maybe to Johnston Atoll, which is the closest reef to here, and then hop into the middle of the Hawaiian archipelago. The other way we're pretty sure that some of the biodiversity comes is from the region of Japan. Mm -hmm. There's an ocean current called the North Pacific Gyre that sweeps up past Japan. And we know like there's a Japanese angelfish that shows up in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. So we know that's another gateway. It's one of the possible routes that all this wonderful reef biodiversity can colonize Hawaii. We know the Opihi came from Japan about five million years ago. We know that Japanese angelfish showed up here recently, but there's other things like sea cucumbers and butterfly fishes that we're pretty sure came from the south, came up through the Line Islands and through Johnston Atoll. And what kind of information is leading you to those preliminary um, conclusions? Our first round of genetic data. We looked at three of the endemic butterfly fishes. Endemic means they only appear, they only occur here in Hawaii. And two of them seem to have come from the south. Maybe their origins were in French Polynesia. And they colonized up the Line Islands and hopscotched into Hawaii. University of Hawaii's Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. We're talking with expedition collection leader Derek Kraft. Derek is not your average spearfisher. Most people spearfish for food, but Derek spears to collect samples for DNA analysis, often searching for very small, hard to see, and hard to catch fishes. What is your role in organizing or being part of this expedition to Kiribati? I was, I am a research assistant actually under my lab mate Richard, and I handle the field side of most of this research. So I'm actually out collecting fish on a weekly basis. I kind of feel a little bit more in charge of a lot of the equipment. So the spears and the bags and the actual uh, logistics of operating what we kind of do day to day. So making sure the spears are sharp, making sure we have vials, and making sure all of our stuff shows up. How many dives do you think he went on while you were there? We did 12 in five days. How many specimens did you guys collect? Probably about over 800. Across a spectrum of fish, invertebrates. Yep, we got corals. fish, corals, we got calories, snails. On the first day alone, I think we got about 280 fish. And what kind of a solution do you put the fish clips in, the fin clips mm -hmm. in to preserve them? It's DMSO, which is a salt buffer. Uh -huh. So the tissue can go in there and it, uh, it'll preserve it, and, or we could use ethanol, alcohol. So sort of like pickling something, I guess. Sure. Or, um... Yeah, but it's a solution that's safe and it'll keep the DNA intact. It's been a real treat to be able to go out into the water a couple times a week or once a week at least. Uh, for a lot of people, the field work is, you know, the kind of the, the fun part and the nice part. You gotta go out, you gotta go free diving, you gotta go scuba diving, you gotta go out on the boat. And to be able to do that part of the work, you know, for most of my job is what I'm supposed to do is, is a real treat. I get to know the reef really well. I get to know my specimens really well. What are some of the trickier types of fish to get? Small ones. <laughs> The small ones, the chromis, we had a really uh, hard time with. Luckily, they're in schools, and they'll kind of hang out just above all the reef. And so you shoot at the outside of the schools to get them to compact a little bit more. And then as you shoot, you just hopefully get one. I remember I would inhale, load the spear, shoot, 
exhale. Inhale, load the spear, shoot, exhale, and just by luck of the draw, you hit a few. Next, we're talking with researcher Charlie Westbrook. Charlie is a graduate student researcher studying cryopreservation techniques, the super cooling of sperm, eggs, and larvae for aquaculture of the collector urchin. He joined Dr. Bowen's team in Queres Mas as an invertebrate expert. He also helped to collect fishes for genetic analysis. I understand that you were also part of this recent expedition to Christmas Island uh, with researchers from the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology trying to understand how fishes are related across the Pacific and how do we get the populations we have here in Hawaii. What was your role in that expedition? First of all, I was like super stoked to be a part of that expedition at all because I was, I was just, I didn't expect to be invited. So that was awesome. From a field logistics perspective, I was just kind of um, just assisting, making sure that we had everything we needed on the boat, making sure the spears were there, making sure that everyone had tanks and whatnot. But yeah, I was just really kind of working in a, and I guess an, an assistant manner and for me, it's just a really cool, I guess, opportunity to get that field experience because otherwise it's, it's really difficult sometimes to get to go out to these very distant remote locations. And so it was a really cool opportunity for me to go out and, and kind of do a project that's outside of what I usually focus on and work with fish and stuff like that. One of my favorite parts of the trip was really just that first dive that we did jumping in the water I didn't know what to expect because the only places I've ever dove were the Mediterranean and here. And, uh, and the Mediterranean where I, where I was, the fish um, diversity wasn't that great. Here in Hawaii, it's, it's the most I've ever seen. So to me, this was like the pinnacle. I was like, wow, this is, this is crazy. But then going to Christmas and getting in the water and just seeing these masses of fish, it was just like, whoa, like I was just mind blown. Um, and just seeing a lot of large fish, uh, large diversities and just huge abundance of of different types of fish was just really cool. Um, seeing the big milk fish at the surface that were just cruising around and the jacks and the barracudas that we'd run into and these, there's this one point I remember we were, we were starting to surface and this big school of barracuda just came out of nowhere and it just kind of like split in half and just swam around us and it was just like, whoa, like this is the stuff you hear about and like you see in documentaries and just getting to experience that was, was really unique and, and special I think for me and it just kind of like rekindles that flame I think inside of like why you do research is like this is what you're trying to protect like this is what you want to see um, kind of passed on to the next generation. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. Welcome back. We're at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology with researcher Joshua Kopis. Josh, tell yes. me what you got going on here. Well, so the first step when we're processing tissue samples um, in the lab is to extract DNA from the tissue. And so that's what I'm doing here. When we come back from the field, we have a vial um, of tissue, and it's generally a fin clip. And um, so we take some of that tissue out of the vial. This is a butterfly fish. And then um, there are different extraction methods, but we use for fish in this lab um, often the what's called the hot shot protocol. And, and really you just add 50 micromolar NaOH. Sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide, yes. And so once you've done that, this, this sample is ready to go into the thermocycler and we set it in the thermocycler that heats it up to a particular temperature and it lyses the cell, um, opens up the nucleus and releases the DNA. Then essentially you have DNA in, in liquid form uh -huh. that you can move forward with your um, PCR or whatever method that you are going to use down the line from here. And what that does is it takes, it takes the DNA 
it cuts it at a certain region of the DNA that we're interested in, and then it replicates that region over and over and over and over again. From there, it, it eventually goes to the sequencer, and the sequencer reads each of the different bases, and it actually reads the DNA, and it gives you the AGTC code back um, that we can then use for analysis with different computer programs. I, yeah, I really am looking at the last glacial period, and, and really um, that's a very short amount of time in, in the scheme of, of relation, species relationships. Glacial cycles currently operate on a about a 100,000 year cycle where the sea level drops during the glacials, glacials when, when, when we're in an ice age. And as the ice melts and the sea level rises, the bathymetry or the habitat changes. The um, amount of um, available habitat for shallow reef fishes increases as the sea level rises. So the sea levels, we're, we're at the top of one of those cycles. Sea level is now higher than it's actually been for quite a while due to other factors like global warming. And it's possible that the connection between Christmas Island and Hawaii might actually be more obtainable at the lower sea level where the sea levels are 100 meters lower and some of those seamounts that are now in too deep a water to, to support any of the coral reef fishes or invertebrates might actually be accessible to them during the LGM or as sea level drops. So that might provide more stepping stones in, into Hawaii than we currently have. So when we sort of look at our Pacific Ocean Basin now, we don't see all of the stepping stones that might historically have been there. Possibly. That's yes. really cool. And that's, um, that's part of what I hope to resolve in, in my dissertation. Next, researcher Richard Coleman verifies the copied DNA fragments. In each of these different wells here we have each well represents one individual, and in each well there's millions of copies of that one fragment that we're interested in looking at. And so from this step, we'll transfer it to this gel. We'll run it through, and hopefully we have positive results. <laughs> All right, let's do it. So in each of these wells, we have a die. So that helps us visualize that we're inserting the DNA into the right location. And that's the blue color. That's the blue color that you see. And about how big of the uh, is the piece of DNA that you guys use for your connectivity work? So this is looking at um, an area of the mitochondrial called CO1, cytochrome oxidase 1. And the fragment that we're looking at is roughly between seven and 800 base pairs. And so now you're gonna put the lid on it and run some electricity through there? Yeah. The DNA will flow towards the negative. And that just separates it by size? Yes. And then when we see these little bubbles, we know that the charge is running through. Once we have these samples that we know work, that we have DNA for, then we'll send it off to a sequencing lab where they'll actually perform the, um, the sequencing of the DNA. And then when you get those sequences back, what do you do with them? That's when we start the analysis. That's when the fun stuff starts. How many of the unique sequences are shared across locations? And that information just gives us, can, can help us inform how, how much reproduction is occurring between the different locations that we're interested in. Because you can't just go underwater and ask the fish like, hey, where have you been? And where do you get your that would eggs make and sperm? <laughs> so simple. They usually run away from you <laughs> when you try to ask them that. <laughs> and where do you go from here? Like you're sort of building these skills, building this body of knowledge, and what is your next step? I would ultimately want to use these type of techniques to inform conservation. For conservation, it's important to understand where our food resources come from. So the species that I'm working on are targeted specifically by recreational fishers. So the ones that, you know, you go out to the beach, you see all the guys with the spear, spears coming out, or, you know, the reels. So those are the, the species that I'm interested in. Can you tell me what kind of species those are? Yeah, so I'm looking 
looking at Manini, mm -hmm. so Acanthera stratostegas, and Cole, just indicated astragosis. And Cole is endemic to Hawaii. And that's the brown surgeon fish with the yellow ring around the eye, and Manini is a convict tang. Mm -hmm. So they're really common, and they're heavily fished by recreational fishers. And particularly in the main Hawaiian islands, when, at least from my travels, when I visit other areas, it's very apparent that the populations of Manini are heavily impacted on Oahu in particular. DNA is made up of four different letter pairs, right? A, G, C, and T. And that is what makes up the genetic code. Without getting too technical about it, essentially when you sequence DNA, what the sequencer does is it attaches a different colored fluorescent tag to each A, G, C, or T. And then it runs through them and it shines a laser on them, which makes those things glow. And then it reads the color. So you'll get green, red, yellow, blue, whatever. And so what we get back is essentially uh, from the sequencer is what colors the sequencer saw as it was reading through the DNA that you put into it. And so what that shows up like on the computer screen is, is essentially you get these little waves of the different colors and the height of the wave is how strong that color was, which essentially means how confident you are that that's the actual base that you saw in DNA. Because biology is messy and, <laughs> and you know, DNA sequencing is not perfect. So it has to, we have to sort of gauge our confidence in how well it worked. But ultimately, so what we see is these, we call them peaks. So red is A, green is T, yellow is G, and blue is C. And so this is essentially what the DNA sequence looks like. And we have a series of A's, G's, T's, and C's. And uh, if you sequence my DNA, would it also look like that? It would like look that? exactly like this. You would have obviously a different sequence of A's, G's, C's, and T's, but this is what you would see if we sequenced basically any DNA that you sequence, more or less going to look exactly like this. The computer will go through each sequence and analyze them, and it'll line them up based on how, how many of those A's, G's, C's, and T's have changed between one sequence to another. Most simply, the idea is that the more the sequences are changed, the less related those two fish are to one another. The sort of two hypotheses for origins, right, are Japan and the Lion Islands, right? So we've sampled a fish in Japan, we've sampled a fish in Hawaii, and we've sampled a fish in Christmas. We look at the sequences for the three of those, and if you look at, well, the Hawaii and the Christmas one are more similar than the Hawaii and the Japan one, the story is most likely that that, that over the evolutionary time of that species, it probably originated in the Christmas Islands. The other thing that we can look at is when we take a bunch of them, which we do, you know, 20 or 30 individuals from each place. There's this idea of, it's called genetic diversity. It means like within the group of things that you have, how different are they from one another? If there is more genetic diversity, it indicates that it's probably an older population because it's had more time to evolve and change. The fundamental definition of science to me is figuring out stuff about stuff, right? That's, that's what it is, right? And so that's what drives me. And so that's what this is, right? Is you have these patterns that abstractly should make some sense. And then when you look at the real world data, it's dirty. And then trying to tease out, but the patterns still exist, right? Mm -hmm. So trying to tease out these patterns from the messy kind of real world information to tell a real world story is just a really interesting challenge to me. And I, and I love, yeah, being able to draw those pictures and being able to show what's actually going on. Very cool. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is a dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. Teaching ocean science concepts through the disciplines of physics, chemistry, biology, and ecology. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now available freely online. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org.